Like, what what time is your place? Uh, it's just half past eight, so it's not too bad. Oh, That's not bad for you. And how about you, Rachel? What's your time? Uh, eleven thirty. Very nice. <laughs> oh, perfect timing. In the afternoon, right? In the afternoon. Sorry, eleven thirty. Yeah, eleven thirty in the morning. In the morning. Yeah. I'm now 1.34. That's fine. I get bed late at like 2 o'clock. Yeah. I usually go to bed at 2. Yeah. So it's just one one hour. Oh, recording has started. So I should be careful. <laughs> oh, yeah, today is spotlight. <laughs> yeah, I'm just testing all these things. So many things to play with. Um. Tomorrow is Saturday. Yay. Oh, it's good for you. I still have one more day. I teach in the afternoon, so I'm going to sleep until like 10 o'clock. Oh, <laughs> you're still <laughs> Friday. Morning, Friday. At one o'clock, my teaching starts one on Zoom and the other one I have to go in person. Uh, Do you have what's the percentage of um, in person sessions versus um, virtual no, ones that you have? In person in now, but the one in Zoom is because we are working across. Yeah. Hi, Shafika, are you there? Hi, hi. Uh, hi. Hi, doctor. Uh, hi, Annie. Um, I'm having trouble. I keep getting pushed out, uh, kicked out from teams. Is this oh. something to do with the... I think perhaps uh, I think perhaps the connection or somehow any maybe perhaps oh. you just join because I I am I'm not kicking anyone out <laughs> already. Uh, so if let's say you get kicked out, perhaps you can just join in again. So Safika, have all the students, everyone joined in? Have all uh, the participants joined? As per currently, there are including all the parents and me, uh, twenty eight. I think have it's you only have part joined part. joined all of them yet or not yet? No, have no. You? They haven't. Okay. They haven't joined in it. But some mm. of them is already here. Is already here. So um, perhaps, um, perhaps we can just start. So maybe perhaps they will just come in later on. You know, and then when yeah. they come, they will just uh, omit them in. Yeah. Okay. So ladies, uh, uh, we will start now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, a very good uh, afternoon to everyone. A good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, good evening from uh, everyone, uh, wherever you are currently. So I would like to welcome everyone, the panels, uh, our guests, uh, to our um, second talk of the year uh, by the Office of Postgraduate Studies, CCSI University. So today's topic uh, will revolve around the art of speaking science. Okay. So. Um, with us today, we have our uh, four panels, each of every one of them, um, great women in their respective field <laughs> with various backgrounds related. So um, we have Associate Professor Dr. Crystal Lim Siu Ying from UCSI University. Hi, Dr. Crystal. Okay. And also we have uh, with us a uh, far away from uh, uh, the America, uh, Prof, uh, Professor Dr. Bhavani Turai Singham from University of Texas at Dallas, who is an expert in cybersecurity and data science. Welcome, Prof. Okay, and then uh, from uh, Professors Without Borders, Pro Weibo, we have Rachel Wanik and Yetinde Odunsi. Welcome, welcome. So thank you to all the panelists for letting your time today uh, for today's uh, session. Okay, a little bit uh, on housekeeping to all the guests uh, for today's talk. Okay, um, I appreciate if all the guests are participants, you can mute yourself okay, during this session. So we will have a Q&A session after all the panelists have presented uh, with their presentation and uh, answering question. So during uh, the session, if any of the guests you have question, you can uh, either use your microphone uh, to ask questions to any of the panelists, or you can uh, actually send me a text if in case your chat box, the chat box doesn't work, because I think some of us is having problem as well with the chat box, yeah? So um, the flow for today will be, um, I will ask a question to uh, every and uh, all the panelists, okay? And they will answer each of the respective questions given to them. So towards the end, uh, we will have our Q&A session and then we have a group photo before we end the session. 
And for all the uh, participants for today's talk, okay, later on, I uh, will provide a link, a survey link to you guys to fill up so that uh, when you fill up the link, uh, uh, the set of participating for this talk will be sent to you, to your email respectively. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the first session, let's start first um, with uh, Dr. Crystal uh, from UCSI University. So, uh, Dr. Crystal is currently an Associate Professor and Deputy Dean at UCSI University Faculty of Applied Sciences. Um, she have a, uh, she is uh, very uh, well known in the area for biomedical sciences, and also she has a PhD in molecular medicine from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of uh, University of Putra, Malaysia, UPM. So she also completed her postgraduate diploma in tertiary teaching at UCSI University. So Dr. Krista is also active in um, science education, you know, and she will, she loves to apply a fun learning approach into all her classes. So Dr. Krista, uh, the first question is for you actually for today's uh, session. Okay, now um, as someone who's involved in many all the workshops, you know, presenting science to various levels of the community, okay, so can you share with us uh, some of your experience or some of the ways on how can we we communicate science better you know what are the things that we can use to apply yeah so over to you dr crystal all right thank you very much north africa and uh, thanks for inviting us to uh, this session today so i'll begin by sharing my screen to answer your question Shafika. and uh, can i confirm that you can see my screen uh, yes Yes, huh? okay. Um, all right. So, um, hi everyone, and welcome to this uh, speaking the art of science. So, let me just put on my pointer as well. So, my answer to North Africa's question will be being engaging in your presentation of science. Now, as she already uh, introduced me, I'll just skip this plot, this slide. Okay, most of it. And the question I'd like to ask you guys is: I think most of you know who this guy is. I know he has passed on, but he is famous enough that all of you know who he is. You know, is there anyone from the audience who would like to volunteer to name him? Anyone at all? Don't be shy. <laughs> Everyone so shy. Shafika, do you know who he is? <laughs> the late founder of Apple. Steve <laughs> <laughs> job. Steve Jobs. I forgot his name. <laughs> I'm not really an Apple user. Steve, Steve well, Jobs, Mr. right? Steve Jobs, yes, yes, thank you very much. So Steve Jobs is the founder of Apple, one of the founders of Apple, and he has been known to be a storyteller. And he's a storyteller because he's the one that makes Apple a household name. Now, what's in a storyteller and why was he so successful? And in terms of um, this is what we experience, and I think today's audience is a mixture of academicians, uh, postgraduate students, undergraduate students, and even people who might not be in, you know, in the field of academics and science at all. So that's why you're here in a perfect way. So we have at some point or other in our lives been either the presenter that you see here and your audiences are all like, oh, or we can be the audience who has listened to a pretty boring presenter as well, which is why the uh, catch or the hook is that you would need to relate to the audience that you're going to present to. And how might you do that? So you need to be engaging to care about your audience by knowing your audience and what you think that they want to know from you. Now, many a time what you want to say is a lot more than what they're actually interested in. And the relevance in terms of the overlap you see here is actually quite little. And they will then stop paying attention when this relevance is outside the area that they're interested in. Now, when we are presenting to fellow scientists, for example, if you are a postgraduate student, for example, if you are, let's say, presenting at a conference, for example, then you might want to apply this present, um, what do you call this, uh, strategy. And present here actually has a meaning to it. Okay, I'll go on to the next slide. So you plan from the start, whereby you place the integral parts of the presentation in a logical sequence. And then it goes on from there to reduce the amount of text and visuals, to elucidate the methods, to summarize your results and key messages, to effectively deliver your message, 
And one more thing that people don't usually do is to note all the shortcomings. Now, when you actually go for presentations, sometimes you might have feedback from the audience. Note all those shortcomings. That's how you can improve in future. And you can also transform your own and the current thinking of others if the presentation is done in a very good way. All right. Now, there's even um, papers that are published in how to prepare and deliver a scientific presentation. This is one that I found that was published sometime in 20. 2013, I think I'm not mistaken, and it was done by neuroscientists. So it is in a way uh, a science and also an art. So when you del deliver a scientific presentation, not only do you actually want to make sure the content is what you want to convey, but the way that you convey is also very important. After all, as Steve Jobs was a very good salesman, Apple was only able to be a household name because of him. If he was not a great presenter, we might not even know the Apple of today, for example. So in terms of presenting to fellow scientists, you can follow a story arc. So the story arc is something like what you see here in the slides. We can start off with the attention grabber or a bang, as you can put it. So a bang here might sometimes cause the audience to be a bit confused, like what? So for example, just now, you, um, my starting wasn't really a bang, but you might be wondering earlier, so why was I showing a picture of Steve Jobs in a, in a presentation on the art of speaking science and trying to answer North Africa's question? Well, the way is that you want to have someone or something as your first slide to be able to relate to the average audience. And most of most of the people in the audience would know who Steve Jobs is and was. Okay? So we start off with a bang and attention grabber. And so once you have the attention of this person, then you might want to do an introduction. So in terms of introduction is you already have the audience's attention, but why should the audience care? So give them a reason to care. So after you give them a reason to care, then you throw them the scientific question, which is the problem. And when they listen to that problem, they, oh, okay, I get it, but how are you going to do that? So that is when you present your methods. So in a sequence like that, after which you then create some kind of either a conflict or a climax where your audience were like, oh my God, that happened. How are you going to fix that all? What do you find? I need to know. Either one will do. So when the audience is in that kind of mode, they are ready to give them the results. So then you give them the results, then they're, oh, that's what you got. So cool. What does it mean? So the meaning part is when it is the relevance to the audience that is that kicks in at this point in time, whereby when they see that's what it means, they see the importance of listening to your talk. So way down there is a discussion. So when you present a the discussion, they'll then be able to see how your talk relates to the world and your initial attention grabber in the first place, which can then lead to your conclusion. And so from there, we usually use PowerPoint in our daily lives nowadays to showcase our research findings or to do our lectures or to just share anything, especially in the online mode in this entire pandemic situation. So in terms of PowerPoints, there are several tips and tricks which can be found relatively easily online to help you create impressive PowerPoint presentations. And as the GIF there says, it's not just the power of point, point, pointing, but there's actually a few tips that you guys would be able to bring home. Now, on the left side, you would see the, the wonderful things that you can do with PowerPoints that will be contributing to effective presentations, including having great content and fewer slides, having high quality graphics and images, having a great contrast of colors of text and background, it wouldn't be good to have multiple colors in the same slide, for example. Having uniform theme, having consistent fonts, color scheme and formatting. Of course, things they are not for you to do is having too many bullet points for the, for the audience to read. Having something called chart junk, I'll show you an example later. Having two flashy animations and transitions, bright colors and excessive text of really tiny, small fonts that people have to squint to see. Now, this is an example of when you present to fellow scientists, how do you actually write your data? So normally when you want to be effective, you write the conclusions for the data, not the descriptions. Not the comparison between the graph on the left and the graph on the right. You take a lot of time to read and process the title, and in the end you may not exactly have to take home message, whereas on the right, you straight away get it hit in the head. Diabetes is more prevalent among the lower educated, and you can see that directly correlating to the graph. Very easy, very straightforward. And how about the next one? And this is what I meant by the chart junk. 
keep it clean. Have charts that are very clean and to the point. For example, if it's here, prevalence of diabetes is highest in the obese, don't have all these kind of color schemes and stuff, and tiny fonts and things like that. Do the ones on the right. Very clean, simple graph and get to the point whereby people can see straight away that 32% of the obese population is diabetic. That brings home the point and that's what you want in the presentation, especially if it's scientific facts. And the last one is actually to keep it really simple because it is very, very tempting to read out whatever you have in your slides. But then, as the cartoon says, your audience will just suffer for it. OK, so keep it simple. A very good tip would be to have like a single picture in a slide and just one or two sentences maximum for the take home message to be effective. All right. So this is presentation for our scientists. And as we as some of us have been through conference presentations, even for all the most well planned PowerPoints and practicing and whatsoever, you may have done the best planning, but Half the time, you no know, things are out of your control. However, this comes with experience as to how you might want to, you know, get that out of the way and get a respectable presentation is still going. And these kind of cartoons are really fun and they come from PhD comics. I think most of you who have done a PhD have read some things from here before. Really cute. Okay. So that's for presenting to fellow scientists. And how about presenting to future scientists, for example, kids? Like I do a bunch of workshops, especially before the pandemic began. And the number one um, keyword for presenting to kids is just one thing, to be fun. So basically, you can forget whatever that I spoke about just now in terms of presenting to fellow scientists. Presenting to future scientists involves a lot of engagement with the kids. And you need to ask a lot of questions to pique their interests because that's when you, know, you get them to think, for example, and you get them to interact with you. So you might also want to use a lot of analogies instead of jargon. And I think um, Pro Bhavani might be talking a bit more about that, but maybe I can throw one of this thing to the audience before I finish up. Now, we are all in this COVID-19 pandemic for the past maybe two, two and a half years. And sometimes I wonder, you know, how, how will you explain the COVID-19 virus to a child, for example, of, of six years old? You might, they may not even know what's a virus. They may not even know what's coronavirus and you know, all that kind of thing. So how might you even describe what COVID-19 is to them? Maybe can I try with someone from the audience? Anyone wants to try this? <laughs> Describing what the COVID-19 virus is to a kid? Anyone wants to take up the challenge? Shafika, any response? <laughs> you can use your microphone. Any of the participants who would like to, you know, take up Dr. Crystal challenge? <laughs> yeah, imagine I'm a six-year-old kid. Try to tell me what the COVID-19 virus is. <laughs> I think most of our participants are still shy. Yeah, Crystal. Very, very shy. Huh? <laughs> very shy, perhaps. <laughs> So that's why when, when presenting science to kids, you might want to also bear in mind on what is the baseline of... Um, yeah. So I think Rachel, I Rachel put her hand up. Ra maybe Rachel wants to answer. Oh, Rachel raised her hand. Okay, Rachel. Well, I thought maybe... Um, so I left my camera on as well. I thought maybe I could help break the ice and inspire other participants to, 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 to speak up uh, soon. Um, uh, not sure. I really, I have no background in medicine or this, but um, I think for a child, I would just say that it's uh, kind of a bug. It's a very small bug that uh, passes between people and the bug can get inside your body and uh, make you sick. Wow. Yay. I could give you virtual claps right now. So yeah, thank you very much for that, Rachel. So we have to see the level of kids. So if the kids are really, really young, something simple like that would do. So six years old, I think that's that's the most I would go with COVID-19 virus. So the kids get older, you might want to describe, oh, it's like maybe a cousin of the bug that causes maybe flu and chicken pox, maybe has spikes on it. That's why it's a bit more dangerous than chicken pox viruses and things like that. And viruses need humans to live because they basically don't eat, they don't poop. That's actually the little piece of drumstick and the little poop 
book right there in the picture. And that's why viruses need humans to live and that's why they're kind of dangerous to us, okay? So that's just something pretty simple and in, in the time I have, I think that's all I'm gonna say for now, right? Um, Shafika, I think that's all the time that I have. I think I'd just like to end it with a little quote from Will Durant, which is, every science begins as philosophy and ends as art. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krista. Interesting point. <laughs> Interesting. I think the uh, same goes for my, uh, even, uh, not even, uh, how old is he? Uh, four years old nephew, you know, he gets the idea. <laughs> we have to tell him, you know, what is COVID. So now he's like, okay, when well, you got flu, oh, COVID, COVID, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he get the idea actually, you know. But yes, I mean, we have to start from young, you know, to to introduce them to various things, to let them know, especially um, um, people who don't have any backgrounds, yeah. So thanks, thank you, thank you, Dr. Christos. Okay, so yeah. next question uh, will be to uh, Professor Bhavani. Okay, so uh, Professor Bhavani um, is the expert in um, uh, data science and cybersecurity. So Professor Dr. Bhavani Turasingam is a founder chair, professor of computer science and founding executive director of the Cybersecurity Research and Education Institute at the University of Texas at Dallas, UTD, I think since 2004, 2021. And she has been uh, a senior strategist in cybersecurity and data science since 2021. So uh, for, I think for more than 40 years, uh, her research and education interests are on integrating cybersecurity and data sciences and machines. Yeah. So um, her past uh, experience also include uh, uh, careers uh, with industry in Honeywell, uh, with Honeywell, Federal Research Laboratory, uh, U.S. government and U.S. academia. Professor has, Professor Bhavani has been involved with more than uh, writing up more than hundred uh, journal articles, three hundred. Uh, conference papers and more, almost 200 keynote and featured addresses with a few patterns. Uh, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, three is still yet to be patented. Is it Prof? <laughs> when I read, okay. And um, Prof also is the elected fellow of the ACM, IEE, the AAS, and the NAI and the BCS. So Professor have received several awards, including the IEECS 1997 Technical Achievement Award, ACM, Six Sec 2010 Outstanding Contribution Awards, uh, among others. So, uh, Professor also the, is the co chair uh, in the Women in Cybersecurity Conference in 2016 and delivered a feature address at the 2018 Women in Data Science at Stanford University. So, Prof, as the leading expert in data science and cybersecurity, I think you have dealt with so many different people, you know, <laughs> who don't understand all the terms, you know, in the cybersecurity, you know, and especially nowadays because a lot of our transaction, our activities is being conducted online and some people, they don't even know, you know, um, what is the you know, what are the viruses uh, that might be there? Perhaps, uh, Prof, you can enlighten us more on how can we make the general public understand better on some of the terms in general uh, cyber security. Thank you so much, Safika, <laughs> for that wonderful introduction. I feel very embarrassed, but anyway, thank you and honored. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen, okay, and. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm putting my conclusion. I have to move. Okay, so the talk, right, explaining complex terms in cybersecurity to the general public. So I talk to all audiences. First, as Dr. Crystal mentioned, to at conferences, uh, to various you know cybersecurity experts, computer scientists. Then I talk to my students, give talks to my students. Then I talk to the general public as Dallas Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth uh, public libraries. Then I talk to newspaper, you know, reporters. They ask about cybersecurity, so I've got to explain to them. Then I talk to, say, our donors of the UT system. The chancellor says to come and give a talk, so I got to talk to them. Every, and and children too. I give you know talks to uh, school school children and also high school, mostly high school students, but I might want to also planning to go into sort of uh, elementary and junior high school students. And so every audience is different. So this talk is going to be, if I were to explain sort of a general public who doesn't really know much about cybersecurity, 
how am I going to explain these concepts? And I'm going to draw some analogy to uh, what's happening in medicine, in particular COVID. And Dr. Crystal gave an excellent uh, sort of presentation and that very nicely leads into what I'm going to say. OK, so the question is, I think there's something. OK, so the, the question is, uh, what? How do you explain this concept of malware? And I'll tell you, if I talk about malware, you might say, what is she talking about? Right. So that's what I'm going to explain. This malware is that really bad bug that uh, Rachel talked about. That's doing all kinds of bad things. So before you talk to the sort of general public or anyone, you have to understand the audience and use the terms they understand, right? And I'm going to give you some examples uh, how I will talk to a scientist you know, who is working in the area versus some other person. So use analogies. And uh, Dr. Crystal had some very good um, tips on that. You know, draw, pic use pictures and so on. Pictures always help, animations and pictures. Make it simple as possible so that they will take the necessary steps because reason is why? Why do I want to educate the general public? Because malware is doing some really bad things. It's a bad agent, bad actor. And the example is malware. Uh, the problem that we're having is that is that it's we are encountering it in a connected world because we are connected all the time with our laptops and our smartphones and our televisions and our cars and everything is connected. And so whenever we have a, a connected world, we can have malware and malware. Earlier we used to call it virus or worms, right? Because they are really causing all these problems that we are hearing about the hacking, the attacks, right? So one day we hear Marriott um, hotel chain is attacked. Another day we hear, hear somebody else's attack. So that's so what is this malware? So I want to draw an analogy. Oh gosh, what's happening now? Oh, good. OK, so I want to draw an analogy. The human body, right? And this is something that we are encountering every day for the past two plus years. Humans are infected with a virus, right? Or bacteria, but we are hearing about virus such as the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV. Two and virus is replicating, right? So this is the virus and it's replicating. So what what happens when it's replicating? Uh, it attacks the it replicates and spreads throughout the body and then it spreads to other people, attacks the vital organs, right? And the problem with the this COVID virus is that it's eventually it's going to attack the lungs, right? Usually that the upper respiratory system then it goes into the lungs. And then that's the that could be the end. So doctor will conduct tests and detects the problem. And then the doctor gives the medicine to slow the progression of the disease, right? And the patient's condition may improve or the patient may die. So that is what is happening to our human body. Computers are very similar. When we talk about computers these days, the laptops and the desktops and the uh, smartphones, anything that has a microprocessor. So what is malware? It is just a piece of software. And what is software? It is a computer program, OK? Just a program. I'll show you an example of software. It's just a computer program. You can see, you know, it's like for, then, if, all these lines, you know, of software program. It's in various programming languages. But it does some really bad things if it gets into your system. It infects a vulnerable or neglected machine. Just like you neglect your health, then the COVID, SARS, COVID virus can go into your body and cause all kinds of problems. Just like if your machine is neglected, if you are not running all the antivirus products, right? The fixes, that's the vaccine. If you don't have the vaccine, then it's neglected. It can go in and cause all kinds of problems, right? Just like the human body. It attacks the various components of the machine. So machine has something called the operating system. That, that's the vital organs like the heart and the lungs and the liver and the kidney. These are vital organs, right? If they are affected, if the malware goes and affects the lungs and you get pneumonia, that's what COVID is doing. And there are some other viruses going and attack, uh, attacking the liver and the heart and the kidneys, right? They can also uh, attack the applications. So I look at the applications uh, as like the limbs, uh, arms and legs. 
So malware goes and attacks something in the leg. Maybe it's not so bad. And the hardware, right? The machine hardware, like all the wires you see, it can attack that too. So that I look at it as the bone, right? So if your vital organs and your bone is gone, then you know you may not live. So it goes just like from person to person, it's spreading the bugs. This malware is going from machine to machine. So from my computer to your, when, when I say machine, I mean computer or my smartphone or my uh, iPhone or whatever, it's going from machine to machine. And it's spreading just like it's going to uh, uh, spreading with people. It cripples the network of machines, just like it's crippling a group of people. If you have a group of people in the room, malware is coming in, the COVID, uh, COVID malware, it's a, it's a virus, it's attacking everyone. Just like that, it can attack a network, a collection of a group of machines, computers. And then what happens? So unlike COVID, what the difference here is this malware is coming and connecting and going into your machine and stealing all your data, all your bank accounts, your passwords, your password to your account, all that is stolen. And then it is sending it to the bad guy who planted it. Malware doesn't come out of anywhere. Someone plants a malware. See, unlike the, uh, the COVID uh, malware, we don't know where it came from, right? Uh, so we don't know the origin of often, but in computer programs, computer malware, somebody has written the malware and spread it, right? So what this malware will go, it will go and steal. So it's like telling someone, go and steal all the jewelry and uh, come back and give it to me. So it's like that. It's going and stealing all the information and sending it to the bad person. So it takes over entire machines and then it'll carry out its agenda. So that's what it does. So it not only it infects you, infects the machine, and it'll go and steal all the stuff and send it to the person so that he or she can use the credit cards and do all kinds of stuff. So it's really that dangerous. Now, if I were to, so this is how I'll explain to a general public, right? If I were to explain to a, uh, to a technical person, computer scientist, because he or she knows what I'm going to talk about. So I'll say, oh, look, this is the malware and these are the things. Look at this statement. This part is doing this. This part is doing this. But if I were to present this to the general public, they may think, what is she talking about? This is an example of a malware. OK, this is what the computer specialists will have to understand. They have got to study this malware to see how they can detect it. So they look at all the patterns in here and then they try to figure out what how to detect it right and give the medicine so the antivirus so those days we used to call malware virus but now we call it malware malware is like malicious software so the antivirus products that you you know like mcafee and symantec so before 1998 this is the bad guy we, these are the good guys us we are chasing the bad guy and chasing the bad guy away but 10 years later that is 2008 it's much worse now we are the ones who are running and the bad guys are chasing us because they are doing so much better. The bad guys, because they are all because remember, we have to handle everything. We have to solve all the problems, all the viruses in the world. All they, the bad guy has to do, virus has to do is find one loophole and get into that person. Right. So it's their job is easier than ours. But you can see the problem we are having. Another thing is, remember, we say that malware is uh, uh, coronavirus is mutating from alpha to beta to gamma to delta to omicron and now we have delta cron and then ba2 right so malware can also mutate and change its pattern so malware is because what it's doing is am i going to get caught right so oh if, if it finds that the antivirus product whatever they are, we are using the vaccine if it finds the vaccine is going to uh, catch us right then the uh, COVID is going to mutate, so the vaccine will not be able to handle this. So it's going to make it difficult as possible. Very much similar. So the malware is learning about our systems and it's going to be and we people like us, we install the fix. We develop the solutions like the AV uh, and then malware knows it. So it's changing its patterns. That is changes program. The program has showed change various parts. So the antivirus, the vaccine, it's not going to catch it. So it continues to be a problem, right? So what it's doing from green to purple to blue, it's change pattern. So what do we do? So we apply, as I said, data mining, data science, machine learning. So this is what I will explain this, this paragraph here to a maybe a scientist. 
so or a student who wants to study this. But to the general purpose, uh, general public, I will say, what is data science machine learning? There's gold. We want to dig, 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 dig for the gold. The data is the gold. We want to dig and then we have to look at patterns. We want to learn and I'll show you examples. So we call it data mining, knowledge discovery, knowledge extraction. Pat All these words are being used, but the, essentially this is the gold, which is data. We dig and then we try to extract those patterns and we learn. So how do we learn? So what we do is we, we use, we, we develop these techniques. It's a little bit technical, but we try to come up with some. So as a researcher, we, I try to look at what other people have done, try to do some enhancements. Then I like try to look at all the software program and see if can I learn something? Because I know what that earlier virus has showed. I know what it looks like. So I know the DNA of COVID is the coronavirus, right? Or I, I know the DNA of some other virus. So I learn. And then when a new virus comes in, I will know exactly what to do, what sort of vaccine to give it. So that's the that's the that's that's what we are doing in machine learning or data mining, whatever. So we try to classify. So first we train, 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 right? So essentially, what do we mean by train? It's like a training a child, show him pictures of this is a car, this is a blue car, this is a light blue car, this is a car, this is a car. We show another, this is another car, this is a third car, fourth car. And then we give a car and ask the child, what is it? The child will say it is a car. That's what machine learning is all about. We learn with examples. So we look at all types of malware. We learn, we learn, we learn what it looks like. Then we have studied. Now we show another ma malware and we will say, is it malware or not? If it is malware, then it's a good class. I'm almost done. If it's a malware, then we say, oh no, it's bad, right? When we test it and say malware, no, it's bad. If it's not malware, then we say it's good. So essentially we want to find, detect the malware because before it starts spreading, we have to know that it has affected us, right? It is in our system. That is what we are trying to do. Once we know that it's in our system, what type of malware, then we can find the vaccine, find the solution. So that's what we are doing here. Okay, so two more. In the end, where do we go? So we, our work, we find a holistic treatment. There's no one person. It's sort of there are three actors that are working together here. So similarly in COVID, you have the doctor, right? The defender, the analysis analyst. You have the patient, the user soldier, and then you have the malware. The malware meaning the, the virus, the COVID. So, this, so you have the doctor, the patient, and the COVID. So I should have said really not the malware, the COVID, coronavirus. But similarly here, the doctor is the defender, like myself trying to develop solutions. The patient is the user or the soldier or the user who is using the system. And the coronavirus, the malware, is actually the bad person, the attacker, right? That piece of mal So this is really coronavirus. I made a mistake, right? So here is coronavirus and then the bad actor attacker, that is the malware. So we are coming up with a, com a comprehensive approach and studying the behaviors. How are they thinking? What are they? Who are they going to attack next? So that's what we are studying. And in last last chart, any gadget that has a microprocessor can be attacked, whether it's your smartphone or your cell phone or whatever. From uh, your television, if it has a gadget, from mainframes to work to workstations to PCs, laptops, Internet of Things, you know your everything that is surveillance cameras, everything, anything can be attacked. So we have to be vigilant. So what, what am I leaving you with? Practice cyber hygiene, just like you want to keep yourself clean, wash your face and have a bath and take all your vitamins, practice cyber hygiene. Change your passwords that don't keep, use the same password over and over again. Back up your data, just like washing your hands and wearing a face mask and develop sol solutions to handle the attacks. And I believe that some solutions are better than none, although not everyone agrees, right? Making you a little bit better is better than letting you die, right? So that sort of ends my presentation. And I think what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see. I'm going to shop, stop sharing the screen. OK, so that that sort of ends my presentation. Thank you, Prof. Um, it's interesting, you know, uh, to get to know it. I mean, with uh, 
for me especially i'm not from a background of science <laughs> or social sciences okay but interesting that it relates to our uh, daily routines even like you say we have to practice cyber uh, sanitation uh, for me to be honest i don't really change my password quite a lot if i change it it will be something similar repetitive so i guess i do need to start uh, you know practicing all these uh, practices to keep on changing to uh, Meaning, we have to protect ourselves. I mean, we even the with uh, this current uh, uh, world that we're living, everything is online. Every data, you know, can be just hacked and everything. So it's a good, interesting point from uh, you, Prof. Thank you so much on that. Okay. So moving on, uh, we will move to the next panel, uh, Rachel as well as Yetunde. So before we, we proceed with Rachel and Yetunde, just a little bit of reminder to all the guests today. So later on after. Um, all the panels have presented, so we have a Q and A session. So you may use your microphone or chat uh, in the chat box to ask questions to the panels, and I will send in a um, a form for the survey to be filled up by all the participants in order for me to be able to send in a certificate of uh, participation for all the participants. Yeah, okay. So okay, moving on to Rachel. Rachel, so uh, Rachel here we have from Pro Vivo, which is Professors uh, Without Borders. So Rachel uh, is uh, the uh, is known as a specialist educator and learning designer. So Rachel has uh, actually been worked with many institutions uh, in the private uh, sector as well as um, working uh, with volunteering work yeah, in all, uh, in I think most of our, uh, the world, especially UK, Africa and Asia. So currently Rachel is the director of programs and a trustee at Professors Without Borders. Yeah, and in addition to, uh, she also involved with facilitating learning programs each year here for uh, Pro Weibo. So Rachel holds a uh, Master's in International Management at the School of Oriental and African Studies and she has spent 15 years in business uh, gaining uh, lots of experiences in areas of finance and non-profit sectors uh, which uh, with uh, most notably with Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs and the UNHCR before she returns to uh, education line. Okay, so uh, as also the president and founder for Nature Ocean Indian, she leads a Mauritian NGO that empowers young people to be active change makers. Uh, uh, Rachel is also a National Geographic Certified Educator, a Teach SDGs Ambassador and Executive Committee Member of the SADC Great Green Wall CSO Network. So Rachel, uh, Pro Vivo mission is to uh, increase equal access to aspiring learning experiences in higher education for uh, people. Yeah. So, can you share on how can we actually communicate science better uh, equally for everyone? You know, at, at a different level, especially for those underprivileged communities. Yeah. So, uh, I pass to you while I share the screen here, ratio. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the lovely introduction and um, welcome to everybody who's here. Uh, I'm sure like me, you are hooked by uh, Crystal and Bhavani's presentations already. Um, uh, let me, I'm gonna to refer to those in a second, but first let me say that yes, I'm here uh, to talk about equity in equity and inclusion in science communications. And uh, if you look at our panel, it's no accident that um, it, it stands strongly on its own merits, and it's also female and incredibly diverse across multiple categories. Um, mm. However, I am fully aware that I am a white wom woman speaking about equity and inclusion. And I recognize that I stand with one foot in each camp in this respect, sometimes uh, marginalized due to my gender, very often privileged due to my race. Um, and I have additional privilege that are also arises from being cisgender, heterosexual, native English speaker. So therefore, I hope that um, during the Q&A session that all of you will jump into the conversation and share your uh, perspectives, as these are vital to the conversation that we're having. So um, I had planned to throw out questions for you to type in the chat box. I'm aware that not everybody has access. So if you do have access to the chat box, please feel free to throw uh, to, to type in um, some thoughts as I throw out questions. 
The rest of you who don't, um, please just make a mental note and um, see what uh, what comes out of the, the discussion from, from, from this side. So with that, I'm going to jump in. And I wanted to say that uh, this, this will build on some of the very important points that um, that Crystal and Bhavani raised. I think the storytelling is hugely important, relating to your audience by knowing your audience, um, and uh, how um, uh, Bhavani was using some brilliant analogies, um, and she used them in a way that was very compelling. I think that I mean, if 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 you didn't at the end of that understand the dangers that malware presents and be a little bit terrified by them and uh, decide uh, like Sophia to say forget um, that um, you know like 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 her I'm now committed to going and making changes after this uh, panel um, but traditionally the science communications model that has been used has had uh, some some major flaws um, Sorry, right, I'm just moving my notes along there. Um, first of all, it has explicit and implicit biases. So these can be historical, cultural, experiential. Um, th these influence the design and the implementation of their work and their communications. So explicit bias is very obvious. It's characterized by overt negative behavior ranging from subtle, such as exclusion, to extreme, such as harassment. But implicit can be the most difficult, implicit biases can be the most difficult to overcome as we are unaware of it or we resist the idea of having it, um, especially those of us that value fairness. And it doesn't, and it, if it doesn't necessarily align with our conscious beliefs. Um, the reason that we have these is because one, our brains are hardwired to seek out patterns and to take shortcuts. And we're two, we're socially conditioned by culture, media and our upbringing. So these exist in all of us. And um, I found a very good example that was a, in a study published in the American Journal of Public Health. It found that physicians with high scores in implicit bias tests tended to dominate conversations with black patients. And as a result, the black patients had less confidence and less trust in the provider and the quality of their care was lower. So here we see a direct correlation between the um, the uh, science communication and the result, which is absolutely the opposite of what the science communicators were consciously intending to do. Uh, next, we have the deficit model. Um, now, the deficit model in science communications treats public audiences as lacking knowledge or experience. Okay, in effect, it's the scientist saying all oh, this non-scientific public doesn't know or doesn't understand these facts that we have, and that's why they ignore us or they don't believe us. If we can just get through to them with this information, then they'll agree or act accordingly. Now, I think we can all uh, imagine a few examples of this. Um, can Do you have any that spring into your mind immediately? Uh, if you have access to the chat box, please drop those in now and um, we'll circle back to look at that. Um, but I'll continue while that's happening. Uh, in the meantime, uh, studies have shown that anyone with an ounce of common sense knows that this uh, just get through to them uh, idea doesn't work. This model also perceives the public's, public as completely blank states. Um, so it's, in other words, it's quite um, condescending. Uh, it's quite um, uh, separate. It's, it's a kind of a them and us model. So it's no surprise then that this tends to minoritize or marginalize populations and groups. Um, uh, obviously, this idea of lack of knowledge is not entirely true in the 21st century when many of us have internet access and uh, levels of education are higher than ever before. Um, most importantly, it also discounts or dismisses types of knowledge that exist outside the typical Western scientific paradigm, this sort of Western white ableist and patriarchal approach um, that's been described in uh, studies, for example, Canfield and Menezes. Um, so, what I'd like uh, if you, uh, the next question I have for you is, can you think of an example 
of one of these types of knowledge that sort of that 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 exists outside this Western scientific paradigm, um, where we are very focused on um, absolute facts, um, the uh, the the model of um, uh, the, the the research that we do, um, anything that anything that would be considered um, a, a system of knowledge. Uh, that is not used that doesn't normally come into this so again if you have access to the chat box please drop your ideas in um uh i'm going to i'm actually going to share a few of my own here um indigenous and aboriginal tend to be two of the big ones that we have discounted for centuries um in addition there are there are other bodies of knowledge that are types of knowledge that have been developed and used in cultures outside Western cultures. So things that have developed um, through the centuries uh, through China, through um, through Islamic cultures, etc. So we have the biases, we have the deficit model, and we have minoritization and marginalization of groups. And these three things combine to reinforce existing systemic inequalities. Um, what's that mean? It means that these practices uphold and exacerbate racism, class discrimination, sexism, and other forms of oppression. Um, so, for example, think of traditional science museum visits where the, the visit and the exhibits, etc., are structured in a very particular way um, that isn't always accessible or welcoming to, uh, to all populations, uh, and therefore there's lower engagement. Uh, think also of um, uh, the, the debate around national parks and the idea of pristine wilderness versus indigenous land use and management. Or another one is lack of communications on the potential effects. And this one I found this morning, it came across my, my um, social media feed. Uh, the lack of communications on the potential effects of the COVID-19 vaccines on menstrual cycles, which led to widespread concerns about fertility issues. So uh, I'd like you all to have a think uh, along with me about what are the inevitable consequences of these factors. Specifically, what would someone who is not white, cisgender, heterosexual, and able-bodied feel if they were listening to a lecture or reading an article or taking a class that was based on the deficit model. Um, use your imagination or draw on personal experience. The ones that I came up with were things like disinterest, irrelevance, not knowing, not understanding how that related to me, inaccessibility, um, perhaps through vocabulary, perhaps through technology, perhaps through physical space. Um, opposing views and beliefs, maybe what I'm hearing or reading is clashing with my belief system. And cognitive dissonance, you know, I've heard all sorts of stuff in the media, oh, this doesn't really correspond with that. Mm, no, I, I, I saw this on Facebook uh, from my friend, I know it's got to be real. All right. Uh, sorry, so could, sorry, could we have the next slide, please? I'm sorry, I have jumped. I oh, know we are. So here we go. So inequitable science communication fails to engage with groups. It makes information access inaccessible. It's also about who is and who is not cited, credited, taught about, or acknowledged, and who and what is heard or not heard. This is the gatekeeping, okay? So the, the, the sanctification of science in this particular way, and it actively diminishes or minoritizes groups. Next slide, please. All right, so a very good illustration of who controls the narrative. These are two maps that illustrate, um, they portray global research production as expressed through science journals published in 2005 on the left versus 2016 on the right. It makes, I think, quite a dramatic point about the complexities of global inequalities in knowledge production and exchange. So please, uh, as you're looking at it, 
have a have a think about what notable differences can you see between the 2005 map and the 2016 map? Are there any shifts in size that illustrate rising or falling in the ranks of global research production? Um, while you're thinking about that and having a look at that map, I'll just make a few points here. Um, English, for various reasons, tends to dominate science. And even more, not just any English, but very specific English. Um, something that we explored in a Professors Without Borders conference uh, on publishing in higher education back uh, early 2020 or uh, possibly 2021. Uh, like many people, I'm mixing up the two years of the pandemic. Um, streams of English that have developed independently from the sort of bastion of uh, the Queen's English or Oxford English are still in many parts considered to be inferior um, as opposed to unique. And uh, this is some, it's a very big thing that affects um, academics uh, around the world, even academics who are native speakers, but they're native speakers in uh, countries outside of England, Canada, the United States and Australia. Um, then, of course, we have all the people who are not native speakers. Uh, so this puts a constraint on them. Let's also think about the privilege of research that comes from a place of interest outside the West. Uh, development imperatives and government policies pressure reach, pressurize researchers to undertake research that's relevant to their problems and but may not be appealing enough or even academic enough to interest the international journals. So um, I have a very nice quotation here. One scholar says African scholars face a critical choice between sacrificing relevance for recognition or recognition for relevance. And another problem with the map is that it measures science journal articles as the only representation of scientific research output, although there are other valid forms. Okay, so um, if you uh, ho hope some of the things that you noticed in the map, the, the differences between the maps in 2005, the number of scientific papers published by published in the United States was more than two times as many as published by the second highest population, China. Uh, the top five were rounded out by Japan, UK and Germany. Whereas in 2016, you can see that China, uh, China uh, grew in the rankings. It overtook the United States uh, and they, the, but China in the US together um, uh, published more than the next three highest. So you can see we don't see a lot of change in from Africa. We don't see a lot of change from South America and we don't see a lot of change in Europe. Right. So what is equity? This is the question. If we're looking for equity in science communications, what is it? It's a process. Thank you. Sorry. A process of reprioritizing opportunities and support to reduce or eliminate systemic imbalances and barriers to power, education, information, or resources, okay? In simple terms, we want to make everything accessible and we want everybody to participate. Um, so how do we achieve this? Next slide, please. Thank you. So there are three very key concepts uh, to employ. Intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity. Reflexivity, excuse me. Let me just give you a quick word on each. Intentionality is the intentional consideration of your audience, your definitions of science, and how marginalized identities are and have been represented and supported in science communications. That is, it's the purposeful choice to deeply embed these considerations at all stages throughout your work. Reciprocity means that science communicators and audiences address past and present inequities through equal partnerships that recognize and value varied forms of expertise and ensure co-created benefit. So that's removing the barriers that create the us and them mentality and changing the monologue to a dialogue. 
which I had really hoped to do with the chat box. So apologies to everybody. And finally, reflexivity. It's continuous and systemic reflection on identities, practices, and outcomes, followed by, and this connects with something that Crystal was saying about using feedback, followed by adaptation as needed to redress inequitable interactions. So that means that the work is never done. Like learning, experimenting, designing, iteration follows iteration in a continual process to fuel steady improvement. Next slide, please. There's a beautiful example of equitable science, science communications done well. During the, um, and it's, so, so this one is also very, is particularly interesting to me as I lived in West Africa at, at, at the time I'm speaking of, during the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016, there was a heightened mistrust of medical professionals and an anti-Western backlash. Science communicators and public health practitioners, to overcome this, they tapped into the folklore and indigenous communication practices of the region's communities. Griots, uh, or griots, uh, are traditionally chroniclers of history, passing down the tribal history to the next generation. They're orators, lyricists, and musicians, and they're comparable to the troubadour tradition in the European Middle Ages. In addition, they act as counselors for their people, which is very important to this. And they often give spiritual guidance, knowledge and advice using music and poetry. So the science communicators partnered with the griot and with popular musicians as well to utilize music to communicate key scientific and public health messages to communities. Uh, as an educator and a musician, I just love this. And this proved to be an efficacious platform through which science communication and public engagement could engender the trust and buy-in of local communities. It then engendered the requisite behavior change from citizens, positively impacting on the containment of the outbreak. So next slide, please. What did they do? They considered the context. And for a moment, I'd really like, I'd really, really love to hear very quickly from a couple of you. There are fact, what factors might you need to bear in mind? You're going to say, uh, run a campaign. OK, or present, uh, make a presentation, consider your context. I've given this uh, starting hint with gender. What are some of the other factors that uh, you should consider while you're preparing? You're getting to know your audience. Please, please just throw out one word. Nobody, nothing bad will happen. Would like to would like to answer Rachel's question. Anyone feel free to use your microphone and, uh, and just give your answer. I see a hand, a uh, Hugh Yung Yeah, there's Kang. a hand there, H. Hugh Yung Kang. Age. Age, perfect, yes. Thank you, what else? Perhaps I can give oh. one, Arisha, culture. Yes, please, yes. Culture, perfect, yep. So we've got gender, we've got age, we've got culture. What am I missing in my in my picture here? I think we can also have, like, language. For sure, for sure, Crystal, thank you. All right, in the interest of time, I'll move, uh, I'll move on. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some of the ones that I've come up. It's not an extensive list by any means, but it captures, you know, some of the major ones. We've got culture, age, gender, and language, as were, as were shared already. Things like sexual orientation, ethnicity, disability, education, level of, type of, um, religion, socioeconomic status, okay? Think about your own, and then also don't forget to think about your own context, all right? Uh, where are you coming from? What, what context are you operating in? And what values, perspectives, and biases are you bringing to the conversation? So remember, cap think, consider both sides. And uh, almost uh, at the end here, I'm going to go another slide, please. And I'm going to provide you with some 
things, uh, some guiding questions that I feel are quite useful when you're preparing to communicate. Um, this is a little bit of a checklist that you could use to, to, to run through. All right. Probably you are already using probably you are already using some of these, but it's definitely worth reiterating and perhaps there are a few new ones. Um, also, it's worth considering them explicitly. Sometimes this is implicit in what we do, but to make it an explicit practice can be even more useful. So who are you communicating with? We're talking about the context here, just as, as we were just discussing. Why are you communicating with them? So what determined the decision to communicate with this particular group and not another one? Why are they communicating with you? Okay, why are they going to read your paper? Why are they going to come to your presentation? Why are they going to listen to your music? Okay, is it obligatory or are they genuinely interested? Are they concerned about or struggling with something? What do you want to achieve with this communication? Okay, look at Bhavani. Bhavani wanted, wants her, when she talks to high school students, she wants them to take action to protect themselves against malware. All right. So what are you trying to achieve? Are you sharing information? Are you inspiring action? Are you changing behavior? But don't forget to consider what they want to get out of this as well. Is it for the purposes of learning or education? Are they looking for solutions to a problem? Or are they trying to understand or clarify some information? about a situation or a situation. Let's think about the how. How are you communicating with them? Is it written form or oral form? Is it in person, online, on paper? Are you using materials or technology of any kind? And are they appropriate? Uh, are you using alternative methods? Things like music from my West Africa example. Art, as Crystal mentioned. Humor, which uh, I definitely saw in both of those. and. I, heard, I fell upon an amazing uh, example of somebody that uses dance in teaching science. How awesome is that? Um, when and where is the setting appropriate? Is it relevant and is it convenient to your audience? And what baggage have you unpacked your own context and your own implicit biases? Um, so, to wrap this all up, I'd like to leave you with a, an excerpt from something by Emily Polk and Sybil Diver at Future Earth, who summarized beautifully, I think, why inclusive science communication benefits everyone, not just marginalized or minoritized groups. Um, they speak specifically to environmental justice, but I believe it applies broadly across all sectors. Incorporating environmental justice into science communication does more than support inclusive communication for marginalized communities. Rather, it benefits all people. First, by including the concerns and insights of the marginalized communities as part of the communication, we increase the social relevance of scientific findings. Second, by communicating scientific problems in a way that connects with more diverse communities, we invite these communities to participate in scientific knowledge production and thereby add important experiences and perspectives to a career field that historically has not been very diverse. This intervention breaks down hierarchies to encourage a more complete understanding of the world and contributes to building a healthier society for all, an act that has never been more urgent. And I'll leave you with one comment in selecting an image for my last slide. I even struggled to find one that was well and truly diverse. This one offered, in my opinion, the widest range of inclusion. But are there any identities that you notice are missing here? Let's talk about that in the conversation. Um, and this is yet another area that we can improve on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, on the uh, presentation on uh, equality, you know. So um, I guess uh, the next one would be up for uh, our youngest panel uh, uh, who are here. We hear from also from Weibo, uh, Pro Weibo. Okay. 
So we have with us uh, here uh, Yetunde Odonsi. So she is a former faculty member at the African Leadership University, where she designed and taught uh, curriculums for mathematics. Okay, uh, Yetunde studied molecular and cell biology for undergrad and postgraduate study. She also worked as a researcher in cancer and aging at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, Germany, which her work focused on the role of uh, telomeres and UV radiation in skin cancer and aging. Her other previous work experience includes ecology research, healthcare management, consulting, as well as entrepreneurship program design and education. So Yetunde uh, was educated in Nigeria, in England and Germany, and she has lived in six countries and tra traveled to many more. Okay, so yet yeah, today, so being the youngest, being the youngest panel, and I think uh, both of us, you know, we are instant generation. So how do you think uh, uh, for today's generation and future generation, how can we actually uh, communicate science better for uh, the science and the non-science uh, you know, uh, community, especially with nowadays, you know, we have TikTok, yes, we have yes. social media, eh? Facebook, Instagram, we and do. we see a lot of people doing it, you know. Even we talk about not only in um, science, cooking, dancing, you know, all these form also considered as informal learning, right? So we would like to hear yeah. from you, Yatinde, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, Safia. I just want to double check that you guys can see my screen. Uh, yes, yes, we yep. can. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. So yes, this is actually quite interesting. And when I was um, given this question earlier, obviously you guys know that this is obviously pre-planned because we don't just make presentations like that. Um, and so the question is, how do scientists speak in the future? So the four questions that came to me when we were talking about this is essentially, how is science spoken? Why is it spoken this way? And is this a problem? And what could be our future? Now. Um, obviously, Crystal has mentioned a lot about how science is spoken. Rachel has talked about some of the issues about, you know, being a problem and the implicit biases and inherent um, exclusions that can happen with science communication. And also, I like the fact that our professor has also spoken about why it's spoken that way. So this is just me now, you know, capping all of that in and allowing us to look a little bit forward. Now, why? How do scientists speak in general? And I'm saying this because when I first went to undergrad, so I'm a little bit like Crystal in the sense that my background is in molecular biology and molecular medicine, so that's what I did in Germany. Um, but the first time I heard about a separate Google was in uni when I was studying as a biochemist and was looking for information and wondered why it looked different from general Google. I'm sure we've all seen this. And since obviously this university, you guys are focused more on Microsoft. No, Microsoft does not have its own version of Google for scholars. Um, I was looking up scientific jar um, jargon and this sort of joke came up. I saw this in the, um, what's it called? The Journal of Medicine, I think. That was in 2000. And um, the professor there, the, the author obviously had written this interesting table about scientific phrases. Now, if you read it, it, it obviously sounds interesting. So if you hear a phrase like, oh, there is a definite trend or a definite trend is evident, the translation could just mean that the data is practically meaningless. So like Rachel hinted at, there is a sort of style of writing, especially that so the, the language of science is English. And that style of writing, even though it's the same words that we're using in English, they tend to mean something else. It's a little bit like and it's a little bit obviously there's it's there's a bit of a joke behind it, but it is quite serious because that is what happens in a lot of science communication to scientists. So in defining jargon, what is scientific jargon? The understanding is that there's two kinds. There's the specialized language, you know, that makes it easier for communication. It's a lot more elegant. I mean, if you're trying to explain the word photosynthesis or you're trying to use a word, I mean, infection these days, because of COVID, everybody's talking about it, inflammation, all of that stuff. But a lot of scientific jargon was created, a lot of scientific nomenclature is created to make the communication easier. But we find that there is now a new kind, which is the pretentious, exclusive, evasive kind. And sometimes it can be unethical because it leads people to think of different things. So let's focus more on the specialized jargon instead. Scientists talk to each other in specialized language. And I see this because obviously I've looked at most of the, the custodians of scientific information is with the journals. When I was you know, a molecular scientist, um, science sort of in training, 
I was reading tons of journals. I was hosting journal clubs. I was spending a lot of time on Google Scholar and realizing, oh my God, so many of the scholarly works are not actually you know, categorized. So between PubMed and Google Scholar and just understanding that your own internet universe is very different from everybody else, you quickly notice that there isn't a scientist, scientists don't actually talk to non-scientists. And that's why I put the ellipses, because I couldn't find any real consistent way in which scientists actually speak to the general public. So that means we have a split in audiences. However, the interest in scientific information is growing exponentially. So I haven't put any numbers because I'm obviously not trying to glaze anybody's eyes or anything, but I'm sure you're aware of it that there is a lot more interest. And if you recognize any of these logos, you probably understand that this entire screen is com combined, is actually contributing to billions of views. You have brilliant.org, which is a website that's focused on teaching mathematics and science courses. So if you want to learn computer science, like the basics, obviously, that's where you would go. And they found that majority of their subscribers are not even people who are working in science. So there is a huge interest and need to know scientific information. TED-Ed literally has millions of views per video and per um, publication. So they send out e email newsletters. And all of that information is consumed within hours of when it's released, and it's literally in the millions. Kurtz Kazakh, and, and again, I know that this is extremely um, English oriented, and I think most of them are actually um, based in the US, except Kurtz Kazakh, who are European, and then Veritasium, which is based in, um, in Australia, but they have a very massive, like most of their audience is basically in the United States. So a lot of these people have now become the custodians of scientific information. And again, if you don't know these things, this might also be an indication of your age, because um, I got, most of us, Coursera was not a thing on, until about, what, a decade ago. And before that, it was MIT's um, open courseware. So unless you are sort of looking for that information or if you're not try if you're used to trying to communicate to other people, these logos won't mean anything to you. And that is the real problem. But is it really a problem? Now, so why does science speak to only to itself? And there are so many reasons for this. And I think because Rachel has touched on it quite intensely, I'm probably not going to talk too much. So I actually ended up deleting some of my slides as we were going. But some of the key ones is that scientists, you're not really trained to communicate with anyone other than other scientists. I spent most of my time in grad schools basically looking for conferences, speaking academic in journal clubs, even the presentations that we supposedly open to the public is more of these poster presentations that, I mean, if, you, if you're not in that industry, you have no idea what's happening. So training-wise, there is a little less of the emphasis of, teach, of teaching you how to communicate outside of your space, outside of your colleagues, your peers, and your, your elders and your betters. So this is a real sort of issue. In fact, scientists are still the worst communicators because we are notorious for having terrible presentations, extremely dull PowerPoint presentations. The fact that we're still using PowerPoint when many other um, groups, academic groups are not even, they've moved to other things is also quite telling. And we're supposed to be the, um, we're expected to be the ones that are innovative because we're constantly learning, we're constantly discovering new things. And so this is actually quite interesting that we are not sort of learning that much when it comes to communication. It is improving, but not nearly fast enough. And then when it came to looking for scientific people that are known, these are the only ones that came to mind. And we did tons of surveys about this. So Crystal, when you show the picture to Steve Jobs, I was completely like, I was tickled pink because I thought, yeah, when you think of like really good communicators, no one thinks Steve Jobs comes to mind simply because Apple as a brand has done this thing where they basically made supposedly high-end technology extremely accessible to everybody. And they do it in the form of their presentations. Like when you talk to an app, a person who uses a product from the company, they somehow seem like they know so much 
And it's quite interesting. And it's because the company is deliberate about making sure that they communicate all those crazy details about their products, which is quite technical to its public. Um, Mr. Feynman, Richard Feynman, I'm sure a lot of you know about this Nobel Prize winner. Part of why he's extremely popular in science circles, at least, again, outside of the scientific community, is because the famous saying, he's very, he's, he, a lot of the content was very focused on, you don't need to have tons and tons of scientific knowledge to understand scientific information. And part of why um, a lot of people are applying for astrophysics and physics courses in general is because Neil deGrasse Tyson is extremely active on the internet. He has podcasts, he's written books, he's everywhere. And again, he's probably everywhere if you're like 35 and under. But a lot of a lot of interest and a lot of information about um, astrophysics and physicists is because of this man. And it's quite interesting to see, like a lot, especially his alma mater, there is an uptick in the the amount of um, applications to that to those the courses that he studied. Now, why are there two audiences? So we've said the first problem is that there's training. So very few scientists are actually trained for it. There's also a knowledge trench, and that trench is partially because of this bias or implicit bias that if you you won't understand scientific information if you don't already have a ton of it in the first place. So it's almost like you have to have gone to university and had a science background to be able to, you know, understand anything. And I think it's kind of true because when I was reading up about the COVID um, pandemic, I didn't Google. I went to PubMed first. That's the, because of my background, that's what I would do. I would go to the source of the information, the people who actually did the research and published the papers and things like that. Everybody else doesn't do that. So there is already a big implicit difference. But this needs to be bridged. And this famous phrase, I think we've all heard it so many times now, but if you cannot explain something in simple terms, you don't understand it. Meaning scientists have to get better at translating all of their works, all of the technical speak into words that everybody understands so that you are not excluding anybody. So that knowledge trench becomes a lot smaller. And then in terms of competition, yes, there is a massive interest in scientific information, but people want to be entertained. People like sensational, you know, titles. And just the fact that scientific information in general is never really clear cut, like, we don't go, oh yes, we can totally cure COVID. No, the answer is a lot more nuanced. I worked in cancer and oh my God, did I get tired of hearing, so when are we gonna find the cure for cancer? And how do you begin with, well, cancer isn't actually one disease. It's so many things with you know these characteristics. I was so thankful for the paper in, I think it was 20, 2001, was it? That described the hallmarks of cancer. And that allowed us to be able to have some sort of reference point to speak to other people about, well, actually, this is not really one disease. Um, so because of the nuances, because of the fact that science is never really clear cut, as much as we tend to sound like we know, oh, yes, this is science, it's there's so much we don't know. And most scientists are extremely humble about the fact that there's so much you don't know. We're constantly ever learning. But the audience can be quite impatient. And again, even that nuance is never communicated. So you'll find that only scientific communication has this sort of barrier and this sort of block between itself and its audience. Because I was looking at other industries that have their own technical speak. And it's not nearly as intense. And also partially because science is for the community and the greater good. So obviously people are invested in it because if Hollywood, like filmmaking, decides to break down, it has consequences, but it's not the kind that people don't necessarily put it on a much more important weight as if scientific information goes wrong because lives are at stake and that sort of thing. And then the question of, is this self-talk a problem? So there's a fact that science information tends to remain within scientific circles with the accidental charismatic scientist that knows how to communicate with the rest of the world. Is this self-talk really a sign of higher intelligence? Are we, you know, the audience not privy to this kind of information? Well, it's a problem because in the past two years, we've seen rampant misinformation because a lot of people don't understand what's actually being said. 
And this can lead to quite dangerous consequences because when we see politics can aggravate some of this misinformation and then if things start getting implemented, it's a runaway effect. So it is a problem that scientists still haven't figured out how to talk to non-scientists. And so I'm sure this is not news to you. And like I said, um, Rachel already talked a lot about some of the problems and even the exclusive um, biases and not this exclusive factors are not also helpful. Now, how should we speak science from now on? Is the future a lot more exclusive? Well, the first thing we have to tackle is the way we think about science communication. And so Catherine Wu in 2017, she wrote in the New Scientific. She's, um, again, she's also in a sort of a similar um, workspace. So she works with tuberculosis. And she just <laughs> wrote an article about you know, why do scientists you know, speak like an alien language? And this quote is something that needs to be present in our minds as scientists, growing scientists, and just as we go on in our careers, that you have to stop thinking of the other. You know, this, and I liked how she put it, that you've compromised your ability to be an effective communicator the minute you think of the general public as other. Because you, as a scientist, you're also part of the general public. A lot of the information that you might be putting out there would also be affecting you and your future generations. And so it's imperative that we have to learn how to communicate to these, to everyone, and understand that we have to communicate to everyone. But we haven't done that. The other things that we have to bear in mind is the form of content. So again, I know this is coming from a perspective because I'm much younger, but it's interesting that most scientific information is still in text form. So journals and textbooks, which I'm not complaining about, and I don't think anyone actually is because we still see that writing is the most effective way to you know, pack a ton of information, but it has to be expanded. Then also, most of the users, especially if you're a young person, you are consuming a lot more video content. And this is again seen in the massive outburst and subscriptions of scientific information. Because if you go to some of these websites, so three blue, one brown, for example, Grant Sanderson is a mathematician. This is a purely maths channel. It's not entertainment. Crash Course as well is not, it's actual, this is real academic scholarly information that they're sharing. It's just like the way it's being presented as, you know, Crystal has already hinted earlier, there's elements of storytelling, there's obviously beautiful animation, Ted Ed are kings at that sort of thing. And they use all of these language and storytelling hooks because that's how humans best understand information. We understand stuff better when it's visual and we're told the stories. So these um, content is a lot in video and we can see that more and more people are subscribing to it. And even us scientists, we find ourselves, you know, engaging a lot more with those, inform those forms of content. Um, in terms of access, even till today, scientific information, one of the things I missed about grad leaving grad school and sort of, you know, moving out of the science life was that I had <laughs> very little access to scientific journals. If I want to read a journal now, I've got to pay an exorbitant amount of money and those paywalls and pricey textbooks are a huge deterrent. So even if you wanted to, because obviously I would tell my, my friends and my colleagues and my peers, oh, hello, you know, you should check, like actually go to PubMed for some of the medical um, journals and look at those things, but a lot of it is not free. So you still have to have those payment walls, which, you know, is a business model thing. I'm sure Springer and all these other publishers would have to think about that as well. Um, and the fact that less than 27% of search engine users actually use the scholarly, scholarly specific search engine. So again, it's not a habit that has been formed. It's there, but we don't use it. And it's partially because we don't tell anyone to use it. We're not present when science communication is actually happening. It's an anomaly as opposed to the norm. And this part made me laugh because <laughs> 9% of high impact journals, in fact, actually most, it, most journals don't have any relevant content in social media, which I thought was unbelievable. Because if you're writing a paper, everybody knows that you submit a paper for publications, even if it's a white paper or for your conferences, you usually have some kind of abstract. Even that abstract now is not enough to just, you know, disseminate information. We need to have 
more things like how do you now convert that information into something that can be consumed on social media? Partially, again, when we did a bit of a survey around this, is because people still can, um, people still associate social social media with, you know, just entertainment. It's trivial. It's superficial. It's flighty, and that's a perspective that needs to change because we now take it quite seriously. News, for example, and credible sources like social media is seen as a credible source source of information for. A lot of people, especially the younger you are, in fact, it's actually quite scary because even my students sort of around that age of 18 to 22 will first go to social media for their information. So YouTube usually being the first point of access. And then now, because teenagers are all in that TikTok life, that's where they go. If you want dermatology content, like you would talk to your dermatologist on TikTok. They're actually there. And it's quite interesting that our scientific custodians, like where they keep, we keep all this information, isn't there. Like I looked at quite a few of them. It's mostly obviously in the molecular biology um, field. So STEM, nature, um, um, journal of style science, all of these guys, none of them have anything that's relevant. Like you don't know what's being published at all when you look at their social media content. So it's not even trying to drive tra traffic to their actual websites and their magazines and their subscriptions. And that's quite an issue. So the form of content could be expanded. The content ac access itself has to be ex expanded. And then the presence of scholarly custodians on social media needs to improve as well. And then in timeline of communication needs, once upon a time, if you were a scientist and you wanted to be able to communicate, you needed to know how to write or use a typewriter or obviously pen and ink. Now there's a laptop because we have presentations, you know, you're presenting, you're creating posters. The first time I engaged with Adobe Illustrator was in my first year in uni for a cell biology presentation because our professor wanted like a really, really nice poster and PowerPoint wasn't cutting it. So a lot of us scientists are finding ourselves using a lot of design tools because we're trying to get better communication needs. So it seems our next step in our evolution is, I left it blank because it's kind of unclear. The future seems to be hinting at video. So perhaps right now we should get better at using Final Cut Pro and all these video <laughs> editing producing skills because the time might come where it's not just making presentations, you might have to make video content about your work. And that just seems like where it's hinting, because again, we can't predict it. Heavens knows what it's gonna look like, but it looks like that. And so we would need to be able to do a lot of these things. So I guess in general, like to sum it all up, science is spoken primarily exclusively to leave out non-scientists and so, all of this information is actually left to the enthusiasts to share and disseminate. Why this happens is a combination, combination of history and also the lack of communication training that a lot of us scientists don't have in terms of how to speak to everyone. Um, it's a problem because again, Rachel has touched on it quite well and extensively. It is a real problem. It excludes a lot of people. There's a lot of mis mis misinformation and people with a lot more influence and power, so our politicians, our governments, can run away with this misinformation and cause even more extensive damage. And what could be our future is, as long as we're thinking about diversity in presentation of the information, expanding our access, expanding communication skills training for scientists, I think we'll be all right. So thanks everyone. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Yetindi, for interesting thoughts uh, uh, on the future of communication and everything. Okay. Cheers. In fact, uh, thank you to all our panels today. So I'm opening up the floors to any of the participants. Maybe you can get one or two questions. Okay. Anyone would like to ask questions to any of our panels? Feel free to use your microphone if you have a question to ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> hi, Shafika. I have a question to ask. I have a question hi, to hi, ask. Lee, hi. hi, since we are from uh, <laughs> all corners of the world, so I'm not sure whether uh, in your country or in your culture, do you face this problem, especially in this uh, COVID area? 
is that there are a lot of uh, miscommunication or pseudo signs about vaccination, about how COVID is transmitted. And often, it just, just now one of the speaker mentioned that uh, the youngsters uh, rely on the social media to get their information, source of information about COVID, right? But surprisingly, the older people, the, the uh, older generation, they also rely on their social media because my parents are also very uh, Facebook uh, savvy nowadays. And they have their, among their own social circle, they have their own uh, WhatsApp group. They share all sorts of amazing, <laughs> I would say amazing uh, theories about how to handle COVID. And, uh, <laughs> and there are a lot of... Um, what I call that traditional medicines, they claim that can be uh, <laughs> effective. So my question would be, so regardless of our culture, so uh, do you think that how, how would be the strategy to communicate accurate science in a simple way to the older generation? Yeah, that is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Or perhaps any of any one of the panel would like to you know share your thoughts on this. Okay, I feel like Crystal will also be able to answer this really well. So that's a really good question. And again, part of the problem is because if you look at all these WhatsApp groups, the ones that the places that they're quoting will usually be some YouTube video or a Facebook post or a Medium blog or something like that. And the person who's written or created that content isn't necessarily a scientist. It might be an enthusiast who might have actually tried to actually go to the actual scientific publications, but a lot of times they piece things together, make it sound like it sounds sensible, and then they just put it out there. So this is why I'm saying that as, as scientists, your skills in communication needs to expand. It's not enough to just be able to write journals because I, I, when I was in school, it was the same thing. We're learning how to write academic journals and sort of academic uh, papers and presentation skills were actually quite accidental. And even till today, a lot, of, a lot of scientists still don't even know how to make really good scientific posters, which is kind of like a summary of your work. So that's the thing, we have to now train with ourselves and unfortunately we can't wait for our schools to teach us. This is something you're just gonna have to pick up on your own, which is how to expand your content. So if you're studying like we were in our lab, for example, we're very focused on telomerase and aging and things like that. I wish we had had a Twitter channel at least, you know, just to put things there that you will not stop aging if you drink telomerase or something like just, learn to condense the information. It sounds a bit silly and it sounds like it's sound bites, but the thing is we have to take a cue from other industries that have gotten better at bridging that gap. You know, the film industry, for example, they're extremely technical. I don't know if you've ever listened to cinematographers and directors and things like that. They have their own lingua and it's insane, but the number of film writing, script writing, videos and whatnot coming from actual directors is unbelievable. And so that gap is a lot smaller. So you can literally find masterclasses by Christopher Nolan and things like that. So you're getting the information directly from the source. I cannot find information about STEM directly from the source. I have to go to Derek Miller. I have to go to John Green. These are writers, by the way, they're not scientists. They love science, they have amazing channels. But the fact is, a lot of us scientists are not putting content. Like as soon as your, your, your paper is written, your abstract is written, let's start also putting out, oh, this should also be for social media as well. Imagine your scientific life, how you have a LinkedIn profile. You could have, you know, how you put up your information on LinkedIn. So I guess I'm saying expand your repertoire of how you put out the information. It's not enough to just write an abstract, put a presentation and that's it. Your video editing skills and your social media digital content creation skills also have to be on par because clearly people need this info, but it's not coming from actual scientists. Cheers. Um, Crystal, you can sort of wrap up if you like. Yeah, thanks for answering that yet today. Um, you know, when uh, when these when the, the the one who asked the question asked this question about the elderly, I was like, oh yeah, that's a marginalized community actually in science, because we keep thinking about the future generations and what the kids would, should learn and to be future scientists and so on and so forth. But I think 
Yeah, on a personal basis, thanks for that, whoever who asked the question. I think it's Dr. Lee. Thanks for that, and I'll make notes to improve in future. Yes, I shouldn't forget about the, the older generation and how they actually understand science. And because of the, I don't know, I'm not sure about the, the rest of the world, but in Asia, we have this thing called the older you are, you eat more salt kind of thing. So when you eat more salt, it means that, you know... <laughs> Yes, I'm more salty than you, kind of something like that. But it also means that I have more experience than you. And that experience means that if you are someone younger than me, no matter how qualified you are, I'm not going to listen to you. So even if you're the world's number one scientist, but you are 10 years younger than me, I'm so sorry. I'm going to believe my friend who's not a scientist, but who's the same age as me. <laughs> so that's something I think. Yeah. This is a very good question. Excellent question. Because the elderly, we, have, we really... We, hardly talk about the elderly. We talk yeah. about how to educate children. I mean, the COVID um, vaccine, that's an excellent example because the elderly, they have to be educated. The vaccine is so important. It will, you know, it will save so many lives. I've had a personal experience. Someone in my extended family was not vaccinated and he died last week. And he's a highly educated person himself, but you know, did not uh, pay attention and essentially believe the anti-vax, uh, you know, the the misinformation. And so elderly, especially because they are the ones, if they're not vaccinated, they get COVID, they will die. And so we really, I mean, that was an excellent question. I never thought about how to educate, not to give misinformation to the elderly, because we talk about children, not not the elderly. And if I may jump in with a final word here, I think uh, echoing these comments that it is an excellent question. I think also um, the parts of the strategy will depend on, you know, again, I'll go back to context, you know, are you trying to um, work with a group of uh, senior citizens in Asia, right, in say, say Malaysia, where you have this culture of, you know, immense respect for your elderly, your elder um, relatives and uh, members of society. How do you how do you incorporate that that same respect in your communication? Or you know, are you in a context where, say, you know, we 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 sometimes say that you know, in the West, we uh, we neglect many of our older relatives and and family members. Um, are they coming from a place of loneliness? Um, Isolation. How can you uh, how can you address that in your your communications? As Yatundi said, um, there's a lot of senior citizens that are active on Facebook, <laughs> which is where you will never see a young person. So you know, if you want to go on social media and you want to reach, uh, if you want to reach that population, make sure you're using the right channels. You're not going to go on TikTok for most of them. Um, and just remember, like, are they coming from a context where, or a, a, a time period where, yeah, you put a mustard poultice on on everything, or you you chewed on ginger, you drank ginger tea, or you, you know, like my mother, my mother is 85 this year, but she was a nurse for, for, for her entire career. So she has a very, very strong faith in the medical community. So, you know, um, Definitely, there's going to be elements of your strategy that are particularly focused on uh, the age, but don't forget there are other components as well. Yeah. Yeah. True, true, true. I think it is the same. Even my mom, she will you know, go through all this WhatsApp and everything, even though, she, you know, all the videos and everything, and she would just like, you know, all oh, this doctor. Um, not only for COVID, but, you know, all these other things, you know, like she have diabetes and everything. And she would go like, you know what, I need to try these medicine, you know, or the ones that being a video showing people using and everything. I would just go crazy on that. It would just be the same, you know. So so I guess it's true. Uh, no, we, we need to focus on every uh, generation, not only the youngsters, but also the elderly in respect, but like what uh, Rachel said, how we transpire uh, the message, how we communicate with them will depend also on who are the people that we're talking to, the culture, the way, the language, the age and everything, right? Okay, uh, any more questions for the panel? Perhaps we can take one more question. So is there no more question from the uh, uh, participants? 
anyone would like to ask one last question before we wrap yeah, up the session? Yeah, hi, thank you. Hi. And this is uh, Chuling from uh, IMU. I think um, I would like to thank all the speakers. It's a fascinating session and uh, the topic itself is very fascinating. So I learned a lot. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, well, well, scientists somehow became scientists because we, we love uh, data, we love facts and science, right? So um, not many of us are creative people. So if we were creative people, we would be in the uh, different, uh, different, yeah, ball game all together, right? Different playing field. So how, how would you recommend that uh, scientists or academicians improve on their uh, science, scientific communication via um, these, you know, new tools that are available? For example, um, the video that was mentioned just now. So we tend to sort of depend on the e-learning department and say, I have this content, can you turn it into something interesting for me, right? So yeah, um, love to hear from the speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I can say something there because I've been around for forever, oldest in the panel. Um, you know, I've been working for 41 years and I think, see, unfortunately, because I was so involved with uh, math and science, from a very young age, uh, I was I I wasn't sort of sort of interested in art, although I liked I was not I was not good at it, and I I don't think I made the made the attempt also. But now I'm and especially this panel. I think some of the things that uh, Yatinde mentioned very important to bring in. Even even what uh, Rachel and Crystal talked about. It's really important to have a very well rounded education when you are very young and parents must uh, really focus on getting now my son. He's a father himself. Now he has small children. Now I'm thinking now for my grandchildren, it's too late for my son because he's also very much math oriented. So for my grandchildren, I really feel that it's very important to give them a rounded education so that they can appreciate because that's the way that to get these ideas across, right? Not just writing, you know, journal papers and so on and conference presentations. We've got to bring in the digital media art. I mean, that has to be instilled and it has to be taught at a young age. It's hard for me now to bring in. I try my best to you know, be active in social media and so on, but I don't think I can. I'm sorry, I'm taking time. I don't think I'm effective at it. And part of the reason is because I haven't been sort of trained in the arts when I was younger. I don't know what the others say, yeah. Well, if I may jump in here, um, there's there's something, there's, so there's two things that um, we, we, I've grown up with this, I, I've believed this for a long time, and it's reflected in, in a lot of the things that we're saying and hearing here right now, is that there is this complete, and separation and break between science and creativity. And, and I would respectfully disagree with that. I think, you know, every time you sit down as a scientist to write a paper, I mean, you'll be creative, creative with your words and your vocabulary and your things, your choices. Every time you make a presentation, every time, you know, every time you design an experiment, I mean, there is there are elements of creativity that you have and you are already using. You're not using them in a way, particular way we've been discussing, but you have them and you use them. So don't underestimate and undervalue that. Um, what you just need to do, like any muscle, is you need to build it up and flex it. Um, and what I would like to do with the permission of, of, of our hosts, I, I came across so many fascinating resources. I had no idea that there is an actual um, discipline and, and uh, industry around science communication. And so I can share sort of some, some resources or links to resources. There's things like um, Biosciences Toastmasters, you know, the Toastmaster group that's specifically set up for bioscientists to improve their public speaking skills. Um, there's um, a communication toolkit by, uh, by the uh, Association of uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science have an extensive mm -hmm. 
communication toolkit. So there's a lot of great resources out there that I can I can share with you that I, I'm very excited about. There's the um, more general ones. There are specific accessibility issues for disabled people. And then, of course, there are the um, equity and inclusion uh, resources as well. Oh, sorry. Very cool one. There's the de-jargonizer. You type your you type your um, text into you copy your pa copy and paste your text into the in one box, just like Google Translate, and it then it highlights in either red, orange, or yellow, um, depending on how uh, how um, uh, how what level of speci specific knowledge that you need to understand this. I thought that one was brilliant. Thank you, thank you from the panel. Um, I Just guess, one um, more thing, if you don't oh, mind yes. me finishing up. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yes, it's please. because if you wanted to start tomorrow, so the lady that asked the question, if you needed to start tomorrow, it seems quite daunting. And like, you know, my other panel members have mentioned, we have to stop thinking that, oh, as scientists, you know, we're not creative people. That's not true. But we don't have to express our creativity the same way like a producer or even an influencer has to express it. But we have to have it. We have to tap into it. And creativity is a skill that we can learn. So the first thing I would say to like if you had to start right now to improve your science communication, there are tools like the one of the, the design tools I love is Canva because Canva, it allows you to be able to create presentations flyers, posters, things like that. So essentially the same information that you have, you suddenly have a platform that will be like, oh, how do you want to present it? So that already is for, would force you to start thinking about these forms. It even has talking presentations. So you can literally put information and then record a video of yourself speaking or an audio like a, like a mini podcast. And again, it's because the attention span of a lot of people is shrinking. So we're now forced to create these sound bites that would hopefully inspire more interest in the actual deeper, you know, information that we have. So that's, you know, Rachel has mentioned a lot of them, but don't feel overwhelmed because these things are very helpful. But the real key thing is to tap into your creativity around the art of summary. How do you expand that same information? Because some of us probably encountered PowerPoint, like we weren't using PowerPoint before. I mean, I was born into that era. I wasn't even born into that era. I met it and then we were told Illustrator is where it's at. Um, so <laughs> it changes. But one thing that's clear is that you, as long as you tap into the creativity, understand the tools. I love the fact that our professor said, I like Zoom. I was like, yes, somebody is on it. So stay on top of what's the new trends. And it's not because you don't have to, like, again, consume a ton of tech top knowledge, but just on social media, you'll see, oh, this is the thing that everyone's using right now. And that's how it starts. So Canva is one tool I like because everyone can use it, like anybody can use it. And it sort of encourages you to be creative because it has templates that you can already touch. And then at some point you might start designing your own stuff. Um, but yeah, don't feel that you are not creative. Yes, you're scientists because we're, you know, we like data and we're curious, but we have other skills because human beings are usually complicated. We're not just one thing. So, yeah, cheers. Thank I you, think Chris, yeah. Dr. Krista, you want to add in as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the super finish up with that is, yeah, in addition to all those resources on learning how to communicate science and stuff. And one last, and I think a very important thing is to cultivate your own passion and your own confidence because no matter how wonderful that slide or canva or video or whatever it's going to be if you don't exude that excite excited state yeah. and stuff no one's really going to listen to that presentation <laughs> that's kind of okay that's really short for me thank you does rachel, you. rachel have a hand rachel has a hand up right or oh, maybe not Oh, sorry, that's, that's <laughs> that was oh, sorry. Rachel's too excited. She has a hand up. <laughs>
So I guess um, um, uh, I'm uh, wondering I guess. whether okay, Safra, uh, I was wondering whether you can take a photograph of all of us and, and you. Ah uh, yes, yes, <laughs> I'm going into it, Prof. Okay, so uh, so before we end, okay, just uh, I just want to share a screen for few, uh, maybe one minute for all the participants, right? Uh, in case because I actually have uh. In the chat box, I've actually uploaded the link for the, uh, what we call it, for the uh, survey. So in case um, you guys cannot, perhaps I'm just sharing uh, with you guys again, just maybe for one minute, uh, the, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, code, okay, for the survey. So in case if you cannot use the link, you can just uh, scan uh, the uh, code for the survey so that I can proceed later on with the cert for participation. Um, okay, while waiting for the participants to go through perhaps the screenshot, it it it's it's been a wonderful uh, few hours. <laughs> we even exceeded the time, but it's 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 a wonderful session, you know, getting all the information, and I believe all the participants and guests as well they enjoyed themselves. Even for me coming up from social science. My major is culinary arts cooking. Even cooking also, we sometimes we have to use uh, signs, you know, when you want to bake something, why your cake is not cooking, why your cream puff it's is not rising. Signs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these things, you know. Safika, if yes. you can put your video, then maybe we can take a photograph of the five of us. I can, uh, wait, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Your video uh, is not on, Safika. My, my camera is not on. I think it's on already, Prof. I think Okay, perhaps. Oh, uh, okay, let me stop on the uh, sharing of this one. Okay, so um, can can I have all the presenters, all the panels, and all the uh, participants also to turn on the camera for us to have a camera session? Everyone, can I have that? Can I have everyone to turn in your camera? Oh, hi, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thanks for asking the question on older people. <laughs> okay, I guess uh, the others, they're not turning on the camera. Okay, so, uh, okay, everyone, uh, can stand by, yeah? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, let, okay, one more. I will take one more. Uh, okay. One, okay, 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 waiting for, okay, hi, Dr. Ko, okay, so one more, one, two, three, okay, okay, nice, I will send it to all the uh, panelists as please well. Do. Thank you. Okay, so I guess uh, that wraps up our session for today, it's been a wonderful session, thank you to uh, Dr. Crystal. To Professor Bavani, thank you for thank joining you. us early morning from uh, Dallas. As well as Rachel, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, hopefully in future, we'll be more this kind of session, uh, perhaps in other forms of ways, especially from uh, Pro Weibo. Perhaps we can collaborate more yeah, Dr. Crystal with Rachel and Yatunde. <laughs> as well as uh, Professor. So thank you so much, everyone, and all the participants. And thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me. Really, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed the <laughs> enjoyed the panel. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. So Cheers. have a good weekend, everyone. You too, everyone. Uh, Stay safe, yeah, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Have a good weekend. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.